Come on, take a moment in your home to just praise God for giving you peace, for the presence of the one who's the Prince of Peace in your life, for God giving you a peace that surpasses all of your understanding that guards your heart and your minds through Christ Jesus. Thank God for peace and we pray for peace uh, in our city and across this nation. Well, brothers and sisters, we continue this series of sermons entitled Rooted, and we hope that you continue to dive deeper into the study of these various churches lifted up in Revelation chapter 2 and 3 in your life group and Bible study gatherings. I want to invite your attention on this Lord's Day to Revelation chapter 2, verses 12 through 17. Revelation 2, verses 12 through 17 and you would find these words as they are printed in the English Standard Version and to the angel of the church in Pergamum write the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword sword I know where you dwell where Satan's throne is yet you hold fast my name and you did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food, sacrifice the idols, and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore repent, if not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to the one who conquers. I will give some of the hidden manna and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. I want to put a tag on this text and with God's help and your prayers for the next few moments, I want to talk from this thought, no compromise, no compromise. Go ahead, type that in the chat and in the comment section, no compromise. The first year of the presidency of Joseph R. Biden has been confronted with numerous challenges from the pandemic, to natural disasters, to immigration challenges, and the chaotic withdrawal of U.S. armed forces from Afghanistan, it seems that he cannot catch a break. One of the prevailing challenges has been the turmoil active in the politics of the U.S. House and Senate. With the Democratic Party holding on to a majority by a thread, tensions couldn't be any worse. As late as this week, it is not so much finding resolution with one's political opponent on what they call the other side of the aisle. The challenge comes with working with those inside one's own party. While an agreement was reached in order to keep the federal government open and functioning into the month of December, there is still the looming challenge of passing a much needed spending package that includes funding for early childhood education and mitigation of the climate crisis we're living through. What has been happening is that there is a standoff between newer and more progressive Democratic representatives and more moderate Democratic senators who are always seeking compromise with their Republican colleagues. These two Democratic senators in particular would rather compromise the desperate needs of their constituents on the altar of this perceived notion of bipartisanship than to take a stand to demonstrate compassion for the least of these. On the other hand, I must applaud these new and progressive Democratic representatives, although I might not agree totally with some of their stances, but I've got to give them their props for their refusal to compromise for anything less than that which has the greatest value and benefit for the American people. This is a sense of what Jesus is speaking into when he speaks to the church here in Pergamum. A church that 
has been for the most part faithful under intense persecution because of their refusal to participate in the worship of the emperor in a city that was known as a bastion of the imperial cult. However, we discover they have some critical flaws in the life of their congregation, principally because they had compromised with the surrounding culture. Here in this passage of scripture, we have the benefit of learning from their experience as Jesus speaks to them long ago so that you and I can avoid falling to the temptation to bow down to what, what is comfortable rather than to stand for what's right. You and I are called to be unrelenting, tenacious. We're called to be unwavering and unyielding in our commitment to Christ and to the life that he's called us to. This text gives us this big idea that God calls faithful followers of Jesus to live convicted by God's word and not conform to this world. First things, first the text teaches us that we cannot compromise the precepts of our faith. What we will notice is that Jesus has a way of seeing good even in the midst of a bad situation. And in verse 13, he gives a commendation to this church and says, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast my name. And you did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was killed among you where Satan dwells. Jesus speaks to this church and refers to the city that they're living in as the place, watch this, where Satan's throne is and where Satan dwells. Jesus calls it as such because among other idolatrous religious practices taking place, this was, as I've said before, a citadel for the imperial, for imperial worship. It was officially known as the provincial capital of the Roman Empire in Asia Minor. And as a consequence, there were at least three temples built there for the worship of the Roman emperors. So this reference could be a reference to imperial worship or it could point to the worship of the Roman god of royal kings symbolized as a bull with horns or the worship of the god of healing symbolized by a snake. We know for the time, from the time of creation, Satan has been represented as a serpent. But whatever the conclusion we come to, this is a place where the believers were pressed and persecuted because they refused to worship any God but the one and only true and living God. God in three persons, the blessed Trinity. And yes, in the midst of a culture given over to idol worship, these believers have the commendation of Jesus that they hold fast to his name and did not deny their faith in him. The personification of such a conviction is seen by this person that we don't know much about by the name of Antipas. What we know from the text is that he was killed for his belief. The reason we know this is because Jesus describes him by the same terminology of which he is described in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5 as a faithful witness. That word witness in the original language is the term where we get our modern English word martyr. And a Christian martyr is one who lays down their life for the sake of the gospel. And here is Antipas holding fast to the precepts of his faith, although he's faced with the reality that he's going to lose his life. And one would wonder what would make him hold on to the precepts of his faith in the face of death. And I believe it's clear in how Jesus announces himself to this church in Pergamum in verse 12. He says, the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. Pergamum had a rare power and right in the Roman Empire, which was the right to execute capital punishment. Execution in some cases would be carried out with a sword. So 
When Jesus says that he has a tarp, sharp two-edged sword, he's saying to this church, you have no reason to fear what man may do to you. I have the sword that penetrates to the deepest levels. In essence, Jesus is saying, ultimately, I'm going to have the last word. And as disciples, we proclaim each and every Sunday that we confess that Jesus is the Christ the son of the living God and proclaim him Lord and savior of the world. This is the bedrock and distinctive creed of Christian faith. It is the foundation of our faith that we believe Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the anointed one, that he's the only begotten son of God and that he not only died and rose from the grave confirming he is our savior, but he is our Lord we earnestly believe and hold to what we confess with our mouths when we confront the challenges of life and the challenges to our faith do we hold fast to what we believe we have to be like these believers in Pergamum and have a faith personified by Antipas that will keep believing no matter how popular or not popular or popular these religious fads may be or trendy it is to not identify with what people call institutional Christianity. You know, these folk who just say, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual. Or even when we are alienated and ostracized for righteousness sake, we have to be willing to hold fast to our faith. What I've discovered is that if we learn to hold on to our faith, here's the shout, our faith will hold on to us. It'll hold on to us when times get tough and when the storms of life are raging and when the ground shakes beneath our feet. You know, it was on December 26, 2004, model Petra Nemkova was on vacation with her boyfriend in Thailand when a tsunami hit that island. Her boyfriend ended up dying as well as 200,000 other people in 14 countries. She ended up having internal injuries as well as a shattered pelvis. And when you think about her, you've got to ask the question, how did she survive? Well, she survived because she clung to a palm tree for eight hours. And brothers and sisters, as we live through this time that Paul spoke of to Timothy, when people will not endure sound doctrine, but having engineers, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. And when we live in a culture where like children, people are tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes, we've got to hold to the tree that Jesus died on. We've got to hold to our belief and stand for the faith that we have in Jesus Christ in the midst of a shifting and changing culture. But here's a second thing that we need to take heed of. We cannot compromise with the persistence of heresy and immorality. Look at the text, verse 14 and 15. But I have a few things against you. You have some, some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Jesus indictment of this church is that there are some who have given in the false teaching and who are continuing in sin. The mention of the teaching of Balaam is referring back to Numbers chapter 22 through 25. You can read that in your quiet moments. In short, in these chapters, Balaam incited Israel to join with the Moabites in their sacrifices and in their sexual immorality because of their unfaithfulness to God and participation in pagan worship, 24,000 people in Israel were killed. Literally, there were people who were saying it was okay to participate in worshiping idols. And the gravity of this practice of idolatry is evident when Jesus uses the language of stumbling, which is a word that highlights that this wasn't just a slight misstep or a wrong turn. It is meant to suggest that this is a severe falling away from the gospel. 
It didn't stop at the heretical license to participate in idol worship, but it went on to give license to persist in sin. And whether we look at the teaching of Balaam or the Nicolaitans who were propagating the same misinformation, they were suggesting to members of the church that sin was somehow acceptable. Now, I know many zero in on the fact that sexual immorality or fornication are highlighted here, but I need to help those in the body of Christ. I need to help you who are obsessed with waist down sins, be careful to stay so focused on these things because you are really only exposing what might possibly be your struggle or proclivity. And Jesus is concerned not only about waist down sins, he's also concerned about the chest up sins. He confronts us for what goes on, not just in the bed, but also for what's happening in our head and in our heart. And if you want to talk about the very things that God hates, come on with me to Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 19, where it says there are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among brothers. I need us to get, that's what Jesus is concerned about. He's concerned about willful, intentional, and unrepentant persistence in sin. And brothers and sisters, in this day and time, we are hypersensitive to the point that we do not want to offend anybody. And as a consequence, many have been made to believe that dipping and dabbling in non-Christian quasi-spiritual practices is acceptable. And I want to caution those of you who trust the Zodiac more than you trust God's plan for your life. Are those who allow people to read your palm but deny the fact that God is holding your destiny in the palm of his hand. Don't you get caught up in anything that will bring into question your faith, your loyalty, your trust and your devotion to God. But further, do not allow yourself to be fooled by the license the world gives you to live your best life under the guise that you only live once. And I know the reality that none of us are better than Paul who said he was the chief sinner and, and he said when I would do good evil is always there y'all let's be honest today we struggle in this earthen vessel but if you are saved and have the Holy Spirit on the inside of you there ought to be a sense of conviction that makes you want to do better there should be such a presence of the Spirit in our lives to break strongholds and break down habits and destroy yokes that create the patterns of sin and there should be a sense of contrition acknowledging the fact that our sinful acts have grieved God they've broken God's heart and then there should be be a change in the direction we're heading with our actions and decisions if Jesus has made the difference in our lives there ought to be something different about our lives you ought to put in the comment section something ought to be different something ought to be different in the way that we're talking the way that we think in the way that we face the realities of life and this is not to say that we're perfect but it does mean that God is perfecting us but at all costs, we cannot, we must not compromise with the ways of this world. As those brilliant Johnson brothers penned the lyrics and composed, lift every voice and sing, lest our feet stray from the places, our God where we met thee, lest our hearts, drunk with the wine of the world, we forget the church. Let's not get to the point where we continue to persist in idolatry and in immorality. But third and finally, church, we cannot compromise because of the promise of Christ's return and reward. You know, there's a resounding theme so far as this is the third of three churches we visited in chapter two of Revelation so far. And with each, there's always this promise of a reward. In Ephesus, the reward was to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. 
in Smyrna, the reward for believers was I will give you the crown of life. We will get to the reward here in Pergamum in just a moment. But before we get there, look at verse 16. And Jesus tells this church that has been infiltrated with idolatry and immorality. It is imperative that they repent. Repentance, church, is to change one's mind, thereby changing one's behavior. This is something that needed to be treated with dispatch and urgency because if they didn't have a renewing of their minds and a change of heart and of behavior, Jesus says, if not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. Here, Jesus is not speaking of his second coming at the end of human history. He is speaking of a visitation that will take place within the span of human history. This visitation will be one where Jesus is coming to purify the church to prepare it for the second coming. And how does he purify the church? In this text, it says Jesus will war with those who have fallen prey to heresy and immorality in the church with the sword in his mouth. In chapter one, this two-edged sword was coming from Jesus' mouth. This is an image that brings into focus what is written in Hebrews 4 and 12 where it says, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. In essence, Jesus is saying, when I come to this church, I'm going to judge it and purify it with the word. That's what Paul expresses in Ephesians 5 when he speaks of the nature of the relationship between a husband and a wife being likened to that of the marriage between Christ and the church. Paul writes, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Some husband didn't hear that this morning, but it goes on to say he gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her, watch this, by the washing of water with the word so that that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. As much as it sounds like judgment, it ought to sound like mercy to us because Jesus still has an intention to spend eternity with all of us when there are those who have lost their way, he will always call them to repentance. Then if by chance, they don't repent. He then gets personally involved in the purifying process. Now, y'all, this looks a whole lot like the gospel because God in Christ came down in human flesh to save us from our sins. But here, this looks like God in Christ coming to save us from ourselves. And there is nothing more that can clean us up better than allowing God's word to cut us to the core so that when we heal, we might see the scar and remember it may have hurt us, but it sure did help us. Hear the reward, church, in verse 17. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. To the one who overcomes and conquers, Jesus promises three things. First, he promises this hidden manna. Manna was that which sustained Israel while they were wandering in the wilderness. It was what was placed in a golden urn and on the inside of the Ark of the Covenant. It is what the psalmist calls the bread of heaven. It's that which is believed to be on the menu at the wedding supper of the Lamb written of later in Revelation. But in addition to the hidden manna, if you overcome, you're going to receive the white stone. In ancient days, white stones were given as invitations that granted entry to celebratory banquets. They were also used in courts of law when someone was acquitted of a crime to signify that the verdict is not guilty. And the name that is written on it is to suggest that those who receive the stone 
are given a new identity. And when you pull all of this together, Jesus has given a promise to the saints that overcome and who conquer the assurance that their admittance has been granted to join into the celebration that's going to take place in eternity throughout ceaseless ages. And when they get there, they'll no longer have to worry about the guilt of what they've done down here on earth. All is going to be forgiven. And just in case you cannot grasp the reality of that, Jesus is going to give you a new identity. Beloved, we have the confidence. If we remain steadfast in the faith, keep ourselves unstained from the wickedness of this world and hold on until the end, we'll be able to join Jesus at his table in eternity to celebrate that we have been redeemed and to rejoice in his presence throughout eternity. The point is this, church. We must refuse the temptation to compromise with this world. This world that will pass away because we have something greater ahead for us to enjoy. I close when I tell you about in 1946, Akio Morita and another man started a company called Tokyo Telecommunications Engineering and what a writer by the name of Kevin Maney called a bombed out department store. Nine years later, the company produced the first portable transistor radio. Belova, an American company, heard of the idea and made an offer to purchase the radios to sell it under their own name, which would make Morita a nice profit. Although his company needed a cash infusion, he turned the deal down because he wanted to sell the radios under his own name. And when he spoke to the executives of this American company, he said to them, I am now taking the first step for the next 50 years of my company. Marita's company went on to become one of the greatest success stories in business. After the portable transistor radio, he built the first VCRs and the first CD players. Not long after he turned the deal down of Bolova, he changed the name of his company to Sony. And today, Sony is worth $138 billion. Imagine what he would have missed out on if he had sold out for instant gratification. And I want to say this to all of us. Keep holding on to Jesus. Let the world have their fleeting pleasures because the sufferings of this present time are not worth to being compared to the glory that's going to be revealed in us. And that's why I've come to understand our forebearance, who while they lived through the hostility and brutality and barbarism of enslavement in the United States, they would sing down in the hush arbors. In the morning when I rise, or when I come to die, give me Jesus. You can have all of this world, but give me Jesus. My brothers and my sisters, I challenge each and every one of you not to compromise what you believe, not to compromise your behavior for instant gratification. You can... Others can have all of this world. Matter of fact, you can lose all that you have. But if you've got Jesus Christ, you have everything that you need in order to make it. Well, my brothers and sisters, it's in these moments I want to offer Christ to somebody. Somebody who's never put their faith, hope, and trust in Jesus. Someone who wants to eat some of that hidden manna and receive the white stone. If that's you on today, I offer Christ to you. How do you receive him? You have to believe that Jesus died for your sins and that he rose from the dead. Confess it with your mouth. You can do that right where you are on today. If you can believe this in your heart and confess it with your mouth, you can be saved in this very instant. And if that's you, I'm going to show you in just a moment how you can respond and how we can assist you in that decision. And there are those of you who've been watching 
today or maybe a number of weeks and the Lord is moving upon you to connect with our church, we would love to have you as part of Mississippi Boulevard Christian Churches. We do what God has called us to do. And if you want to unite with us, we would accept you into our fellowship from wherever you are. My brother, my sister, you can respond in a number of ways. First, you have the option of responding via email. You can send an email to connect at the boulevard.org. Or you can play, you can send a text message to 901-446-4242. Text the word belong to that number and you're gonna receive back a link. When you get that link, click that link and a form is gonna appear. Fill out that form with your best information. And when you submit that information, our team is gonna be in touch to help you with your next decisions. Brother Paul is just going to minister on the organ. And I want our saints to be praying. I want others of you to be sending that email, sending that text message. Somebody needs to make a decision today, right now and in this moment. saints praise God where you are why well, don't you just affirm that today by one more time putting in the chat give me Jesus give me Jesus you can have all of this world but give me Jesus well brothers and sisters we thank God for the word we thank God for decisions that are being made very quickly I want to encourage you in two ways on uh, this week first join us let's get on one accord church i want to know that all of us are fasting on wednesday between 8 a.m and 6 p.m 8 a.m and 6 p.m just 10 hours uh, this uh, wednesday and for the next number of wednesdays during the refresh and then i want you to meet me at 12 noon we ran into some technical difficulties this past week and we got started a little bit late but 12 noon this Wednesday, I want you to meet me on YouTube, on Facebook Live, or through our 302-202-1110 conference call number with access code 319-863. And let's pray together as a body of believers. We know there's so much to pray for, and I hope that you will join me 12 noon this Wednesday. Church, I am excited uh, because we're a little bit shy of a month away from our virtual uh Centennial Founders Day celebration, our virtual Centennial Founders Day celebration. We're just excited about what God is going to do uh, on that Sunday. I want you to save the date, mark your calendars. If you've been slipping with your uh, connecting with our online worship experience, you want to catch this one live and in living color. We have lots of things set up and planned and also lots of things planned for that weekend uh, in totality that are going to be safe. Uh, but on that Sunday, we will be virtual and God has something special in store for us to take part in as we we celebrate a century now let me be clear i want to make this very clear because i know you're asking y'all know we that once uh, we wade through uh the next number of months and hopefully in the spring of 2022 we're gonna celebrate in grand style in person y'all know boulevard style um and so just be on the lookout we're gonna share uh those dates hopefully uh very soon but uh this uh, November, we could in no way uh, be a part of this moment without celebrating what God has done over the past century. You know, God has blessed us to have an illustrious history. God, God also has a glorious destiny for our church, and we're going to achieve that. Well, I would wherever you are today watching, just open your hands like you're getting ready to receive a blessing from God. 
And I want to bless you in the way that God instructed Moses to instruct Aaron to bless the people. And this is what the Lord instructed Aaron to bless the people in this way. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you and God keep you.